because um, you know there's a lot of interest as I already mentioned um, um, for this webinar and some people are not able to join live so um, we are recording this so other people can watch um, our um, yeah, webinar afterwards as well. Also um, I am going to be streaming it live on Facebook um, so just that you know that other colleagues can join our webinar through various channels. So um, as mentioned already, uh, my name is Ricarda Mochilnik and I'm working for the Bridge 47 uh, network. Um, thank you. Um, Bridge 47 is a project, it's a European project coordinated and implemented by 15 European but, over, but also global civil society organizations. May will be speaking um, more about the organizations which are involved in uh, Bridge afterwards. Um, what is our aim? The aim of Bridge 47 is to mobilize and empower civil society and we want to contribute to global justice and to a transformation towards global justice through global citizenship education. So we have four working areas. One of them is uh, yeah, building and coordinating a global network, but we also do a lot of work in advocacy and uh, uh, um, advocating to uh, change policies. We are building partnerships, and this is the framework we are meeting here today. And then we are also working towards capacity building. Um, so these are the different uh, working areas uh, Bridge 47 is uh, active in. So what is our plan for today? Uh, Maeve, um, I mentioned her already, Maeve Galvin, um, she's our partnerships coordinator and she will be sharing Bridge 47's experiences in making partnerships um, with civil society, with uh, um, the private sector, in academia, with trade unions. And she will be sharing with us um, the lessons learned within the Bridge 47 uh, uh, network in this regard. Uh, secondly, we are very um, delighted to have Gabriel, Gabriel Weibel, um, with us. Uh, he is a lecturer at the Institute of uh, European Studies and Interna International Relations at the Comenius University in Bratislava. And he will be also sharing experiences with us in building uh, up the Southeastern Europe Knowledge Exchange Partnership. So he will be telling us more about this. And of course, we want to be hearing about your experiences and your um, um, knowledge about developing partnerships. So um, we will be having uh, these two, two inputs. And then afterwards, there will be time and space for your experience, but also your questions and answers. Um, what I will be doing is collecting your questions um, already during the inputs of the two presenters. So please type in your, your questions, your thoughts, your concerns in the chat box on the right hand side. And I will be um, delivering um, or I will be uh, collecting them and then handing over and delivering them to our uh, colleagues. So, and um, yeah, this was my short uh, introduction and I am already um, handing over to Maeve. Thank you so much, Maeve. Hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your, your time zone. It's great to see so many of you here. We were a little bit worried, I'll confess. Um, we tried to do this similar webinar a year ago and we had one participant. So I think without even having begun, this is already a huge success for us. So thank you very much. Um, as Ricardo explained, I am the coordinator for Bridge 47 on the partnerships team and this means I coordinate and offer support to our team of officers around Europe who are leading and building relationships with a variety of different stakeholders, mostly those who are outside of um, global citizenship education. Um, so we're now in our third year of the project or just about to be in our third year of the project um, and we've had some sort of hard and fast learnings in terms of what to do and what not to do and what's worked for us in terms of building partnerships um, with non-GC practitioners. So today we'll, we'll recap what we've learned and you know see if this can be of use um, to others as they venture on partnerships and, we can, and we'd also love to learn from you as well so hopefully we can make this an interactive session and we're also delighted to have Gabriel here who can 
give the unique insight of actually being part of one of our partnerships um, and tell us what it's like from the inside. So maybe with that, um, Ricardo, if you're happy enough, I will move forward to just to, just to do a few exercises to see who's in the room. Um, I'll, we'll, you, we'll get you to use a bit of technology. If you go on to menti.com with your phone, and if you type in the code that's on the screen, and that's 966-924, um, we're gonna do some polling with you. Okay, excuse my lack of technological know-how. So the first question, and if you type in the code, on menti.com, you'll see it's just a question that comes up, where are you all from? Oh, amazing. We have some Europeans, but not, not too surprising. Okay, four from Europe. Let's see how global we are. We call ourselves a global project, but we do end up being heavily European, unfortunately. Let's give a few people a few more minutes to apply. This is really how they should do the census. It's much more fun. Oh, we have another. I was hoping so. Fourteen. Okay, we seem to be winding down in terms of applicants. Okay, we have another. Do, do let us know in the chat box where you're from because this is, this is useful data for all of us. The next question I have for you guys with the same code. Oh, sorry, people still coming through. It's a little bit finicky to use, I think. Okay, so we 15, 16 Europeans, one other. Mace, do we want to share the screen? Um, oh, can can you not see it? Oh, <laughs> I'm, I apologize. Not a technologist, clearly. You have to stop sharing. Yeah, perfect. There you go. Okay, so you can see our graph. We have 16 Europeans and one other. Um, and and I have another question for you as well. Just hang on two minutes. If you can see on your screen again, we the, the next one is what word describes your experience in partnerships, just so we get a sense of how partnerships have been for you. And the first word, of course, we can see is demanding. Let's let some other words come through. If you can type in using the code again, the code is nine six six nine two four. Exhausting. Oh no, we have skeptics. This is good though. <laughs> Fruitful. Essential, I like that one. Pernickety, that's, that's a wonderful word for everyday use. It's not one I've heard in a while. Exhausting, cooperation, challenging, stressful, slow, multicultural, fun. Okay, challenging is definitely the winner. It's the biggest word. More than one person has used that. Community, I like that. Rewarding, creative. Erasmus Plus, but good to know that that's some essential experience that we have on the line. Innovative, complex. Yeah, this sounds about right. <laughs> this, this all sounds very much in line with our own experiences. Okay, um, so I have another fun exercise for you before we get into um, the more the more nitty gritty. Hang on, and I will switch back because the technology is not working in my favor. So we have um, great partnerships on the screen. Um, take a look at the pictures and see how many of these you can name. Um, I wanna see what kind of knowledge you all have. Okay. 
Should people type it in the chat box? Or? Yes, yes, please. If anyone's particularly good, we can give you a shout out on Facebook. I'll give people a few minutes to venture who's there. Oh, you can name, you can name nine. Do you want to, can, if you can type in the answers, that would be great. This is Gemma and I'm seeing Crisola has six. Okay, they're not as hard as I thought then. I'll give people a few minutes and then I'll, I'll reveal the results. Four, okay. That's good, we wanted it to be a bit challenging. It's just really to get us into the mode of thinking about partnerships. Of course, these examples are all, you know, one-on-one -on -one partnerships, which isn't always the way we work and the way we'd advocate for others to work, but it makes for a good visual. Yeah, and if you can type in the names of the partnerships that you're you're aware of, that would be great. Ah, wonderful. Okay, Gemma Burnside seems to be our our leader here. So she's guessed correctly. She's guessed the Obamas, Mulder and Scully, Paul McCartney and John Lennon, Chewbacca and Han Solo. Mary and Paul Curie, yeah, <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, ben and Jerry, the Wachowski sisters, Fred Astaire and Ginger, Thelma and Louise. Okay, oh, you have nearly... Google, okay, you're all really good. Simon and Garfunkel are not there, actually. Yeah, that's Sergey and Larry from, from Google in the bottom middle. So I think you've guessed everyone and the only one that maybe no one has guessed is the Wright brothers who are on the, um, the left-hand side in the middle looking very stern. Okay, well done everyone. Well done particularly Gemma who definitely won this exercise. Um, so let's move along um, and we'll actually get into the specifics of Bridge 47 partnership. Bear with me, I'm just going to change the technology. Um, Okay, so you should be able to see on your screen the organizations behind Bridge 47. So just to tell you a little bit about who we are, um, you can see our logos there and they might be familiar to you depending on your geography. Our lead organization is Fingo in Finland and the rest of our partners are Scotland, Ireland, Estonia, Latvia, Denmark, Germany, France, Slovenia, Slovakia, Bulgaria and Cyprus, as well as our three international partners, Civicus, ICAI and IADI. Um, so we've quite a diverse group of us working across Europe and for partnerships that of course means that there's a diverse range of potential stakeholders um, for us to, to potentially work with and in some cases certain partners are, are more difficult than others which we'll get into later. So the why of partnerships and why Bridge 47, oh sorry, why Bridge 47 chose to really make an investment and have essentially a quarter of the project focusing on partnerships, there was really this feeling among GC practitioners that of course, you know, we believe GCE can help to counter all sorts of global issues, including, you know, apathy towards climate change, rising levels of intolerance and populism and more. And of course, you know, the question we have to ask ourselves is if GCE or global citizenship education is part of the answer to many of the global challenges, then what good is it if we're keeping it to ourselves? Um, so we've, we've kind of had to really think how can we go outside of our immediate range of typical stakeholders um, and kind of bring GC to new audiences or enhance it, um, where, it, where, it where it isn't very strong. 
Um, and of course the SDGs have been a great opportunity and they've helped us kind of get into certain conversations that we might not have otherwise. But part of the, you know, our mandate is of course demonstrating that the SDGs cannot be achieved without GCE as well. Um, so we have different sections of partnerships in terms of the partners we work with. So we have those in the kind of advocacy space, which are political entities or ministries. Um, but, but then we have, another, we have one particular partnership with, it, with um, a lobby group as well. And the objective of those partnerships is, of course, to influence policy and to get more space for GCE at a policy level. Um, and then we also have a range of partnerships that are focused on academia and researchers and, and educational facilities. And Gabrielle is part of that, and he can talk about that in a little bit more depth just later. And then we have another section of partnerships who are really in the zone of kind of other. Um, and this is the, the focus on these partnerships is those who haven't been exposed to GC perhaps at all, or even may be opposed to it. And these are entities like private sector, police, military, and media. Um, so it's a lot of ambition there. And the goal has essentially been for us how can we ha use partnerships as a tool to have these entities apply GC to their work in one form or, or another? So partnerships are kind of the mechanism, whereas increased GC is essentially the goal. Um, so that's a graph of what our partnerships look like um, across Europe. And just to talk you through it a little bit, I'll start with Ireland as it's where I'm based and um, nationalism rules. Um, so you'll see in Ireland we're, we're partnering with um, female politicians and we're working with a lobby group who um, push for greater numbers of women to be elected and when they do trainings on things like canvassing and lobbying we've set up a training with them to train newly elected um, politicians at council level in the SDGs and how they can use the SDGs as a, as a policy tool. For example, we're also partnering with a responsible business network um, who they're trying to bring their private sector members closer to CSOs and we're trying to bring our CSO members and um, we're, we're trying to help them engage with, with private sector partners. So it's kind of two networks together working on increased partnerships among their networks or, or among their members. In Scotland, and I believe Eleanor's on the line, who is the lead on this, um, we've just begun a really interesting partnership with the National Health Service, which is focused on global citizenship education and health professionals, including those who've returned from working overseas, as well as those who work nationally, increasing the GCE elements of their work. Our knowledge exchange or partner partnerships are run um, by IADI. Um, who are based in Germany and who are the European Association of Research and Development. Um, and they are running several network style partnerships around Europe between universities and CSOs all around global citizenship education. Gabriel is part of one of them, which I'll talk about um, very shortly. In Denmark, we're working with, with CSOs who are who previously not, who haven't worked on, on global citizenship education, but are very strong in the advocacy space and we're hoping that they can increase the footprint of GCE in the advocacy space and increase the footprint of their GCE work as well as partnering um, with governmental organizations and we're also starting something in Denmark very shortly hopefully with a trade union. We're also working in Slovenia with a variety of different CSOs, many of whom wouldn't have worked traditionally on, on GCE, including the Adult Education Centre there, including the ministry. We're pushing for a partnership with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. In Slovakia, we're working with the Ministry of Education and we're also exploring partnerships in the technology space with private sector. In Cyprus, we are working again with a ministry and the ministry is interested in using our partnership to actually bring GCE to media, which is really interesting. In Estonia, we have a coalition of a partnership, which is made up of a variety of CSOs, businesses, and even educational institutions, including Tallinn University. And some of the big multinational companies are part of it too, which is really exciting for us. Um, so, so that particular structure of a partnership in terms of having a coalition is a little bit unique and we have some interesting learnings from that. 
So that's kind of in general um, what our partnerships look like overall. And I know I've bounced through that very quickly, but I'm happy to take questions later on in our Q&A. Um, I'll now pass over to Gabriel, who will talk about his experience in the space of knowledge exchange, academia, CSO partnerships as part of Bridge 47. Over to you, Gabriel. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody, again. So I would like to talk to you maybe briefly in five minutes in uh, how are we setting up the Southeastern European Knowledge Exchange Partnership. This is a partnership which uh, is uh, mainly uh, focusing on a partnership with Slovenia, with the SLOGA, which is a platform for NGOs and also a Slovak uh, umbrella NGOs. They were the ones who approached us in terms of uh, establishing this partnership and then we uh, replied to AID and Bridge 47 call. The initial idea came from a student who was an intern in one of those NGOs because he recognized or remembered uh, one of my lectures which I was giving within my comparative politics, which was on planetary interest, which is an initiative which was uh, entering UN in 1970. And um, basically my background of what I'm teaching, although I try to bring into teaching and also where I studied, I lived and I studied in New Zealand for 12 years, is that um, uh, all those concepts which I learned or which I like uh, is something which kind of merged and came together within this partnership because this is something which I uh, believe uh, in doing and also something which needs to be done in Slovakia on many levels. And what we're trying to do also is to bring uh, together not just uh, the global and international cooperation, but look at some local issues as well. And one of them is, for example, our second workshop, which, I, uh, which is going to be held tomorrow and after tomorrow which is uh, looking at intercultural competence, then uh, in the local issue, which is anti-gypsyism and uh, uh, generational poverty, and also looking at media literacy and digital literacy. So this is a workshop for students. Our, another idea was to add into a condition which was set up to have a partnership between the NGOs and academia and governments, bring also students in, in terms of the workshops and spreading this idea just to see how uh, whatever is done within the GCE is something they can uh, find or identify, identify within their other courses. And also something which they can then uh, maybe uh, take forward into their uh, further career. Some of them or many of the students are doing their internships or work now. So hopefully this is something uh, where we can again find the feedback. So not internships in NGOs only, but in different fields as well. Many of them are in international firms. So our next step would be uh, ideally that we can establish this GCE cell or a unit within the academia and try to see who else is interested in a concept which can then be uh, kind of entered within the studies uh, other academics do. And there is some interest. I mean, maybe the biggest challenge is time Time consume, it's time consuming in terms of uh, having, um, doing all the outreach and organization. Faculty is sometimes uh, difficult as well, but uh, in terms of uh, everybody is being busy and doing their own little projects. So there needs to be time when we all get together and see how, how our little projects uh, can uh, maybe uh, be beneficial to each other. Students in terms of also having time, but many of our students are working. So this is a problematic from a point of view of uh, doing inter some outside of curricular activities, which this is definitely one of those. And so we cannot necessarily uh, get students who would come and participate, even though they are interested in the process and many of them uh, advertise that they are interested. When it comes to the time, um, then uh, they have always some work issues, uh, which prevents them of coming. The resources are fine in terms of uh, backing up uh, this project from Bridge. And also we have a very uh, great coordinating teams. From my experience, this is one of the best I had so far. And another challenge in Slovakia is maybe government. I do know some of the, or one department at the uh, Education, Ministry of Education who is interested, also Ministry of Environment. But uh, it has a bad connotation, this um, global citizenship idea, just from the point of view of having the word global there, because at the moment Slovakia is going through some I don't know, the phase of uh, rising populism again and the globalization has uh, this negative connotation in terms of being anti-nationalistic because national movement is uh, strong again. 
but uh, what is our advantage or strength is, for example, in my case uh, that I studied um, intercultural competence from the point of view of student mobility and internationalization of universities. So there are concepts which I did, did in my PhD as well, which I can bring in. And also working more with students on third year uh, at the university, it is a slow process, but you get the idea how you can uh, work with the students more trustfully and into the future as well. And for example, one of the outcomes of this uh, partnership should be a development of the module. And my hopes are uh, for developing the module which can be attractive enough for students, which is easy and uh, interactive, but also hands-on in terms of teaching. That's why we are trying different concepts. And hopefully this is something which there can be multiplied to different other learning projects. Thank you. Thanks, Gabriel, for that deep dive. Um, so, I mean, I'll I'll give I'll go broader again, and I'll just talk from the the partnership coordination perspective of what we've learned, kind of by doing partnerships across Europe with a variety of different stakeholders. And these learnings are quite general, but we definitely, um, you know, when we capture what we've done, they've been important for us in terms of the objective of Bridge Forty Seven is also to inspire others. So it is it is important for us to kind of share and disseminate maybe the mistakes that we ourselves have made and we've been given um, the freedom to do that a little bit. So some of that um, is coming from our failures in terms of our learnings, but other things are things that we've actually done well that may prove effective for others. Um, so just a really simple learning, but when we started the project, we did learn, we you know, we don't need to start from scratch. We did do mapping exercises um, for individual countries in terms of where could fertile partnerships be. Um, but actually what we found really effective was given that we had a three year time limit to do this, that looking at the existing relationships that we already had and the ones that we could probably go deeper in terms of our investment in or the, the potential partner that we thought, oh, we had that one interaction and it was great. Um, that was probably more economic, actually, rather than going for, you know, the hardest North Star partnership. Um, we've done some of both, actually. Um, but for example, we, we also thought where could be the, um, the most effective curve for change. So for this example of Denmark, where we're in partnership with major NGO platforms um, to enhance their advocacy work by saying, can you work with us and develop you know GCE competency and advocate on GCE as well um, we found that really a good and important approach for us in several cases the second learning I'll share is a really really tough one for us which was investing in our language and um, this may not be true for all of you on the call um, who are outside of the GCE space but certainly you know, the conversation of what is GCE and who are we, especially with those entirely external to it. Um, it was a point of, of stress for us in, on, an, on an individual basis, but also um, it, it meant that we, because our language wasn't always sharp and accessible, it was difficult to write that email asking for a meeting and then getting the meeting. Um, so, and not, you know, and obviously the broader challenge in the sector of jargon and over explaining ourselves. So we had to invest in becoming more effective communicators. And um, so we invested in our messaging and essentially in, in ourselves. We worked with a tone of voice expert. If, if others are interested in, in that experience, I'm very happy to have individual conversations or share contact details. Um, but essentially, he helped us to use simpler, more engaging language and to use stories in order to make stronger connections. A lot of this is quite obvious stuff, but coming together as a team and actually making that investment and challenging ourselves on it, um, it's probably, I wouldn't say it's a problem we fixed, because um, I think it's an ongoing process um, for all of us in our organizations, but it definitely helped. And I think it built our confidence, especially when our team members were approaching, for example, the private sector um, and feeling a little bit daunted because it was the kind of conversation that we, they hadn't had previously. Um, so, I mean, this one is obvious, but just that failure being a learning experience. And again, I'm aware that we came from the strong position of we do have a target in terms of the number of partnerships we need to have, but we, we had enough capacity to be able to aim quite significantly beyond that target. 
um, and to account for attrition. Like we, we had to account for the fact that certain partnerships um, weren't going to last and we had great connections with people who were in organizations and then with staff turnover or something, we lost the connection and the partnership didn't come to fruition. Or, you know, we had bad meetings you know, as you can imagine, we had we had meetings that it didn't connect with certain people on, or or we had sort of prospective partners who kind of led us down a garden path, and then we kind of had to say, actually, we can't invest in this anymore. Um, but so we but we've had to kind of learn when to reroute our course and share what we've learned, um, and like to manage these setbacks, we've just like had to kind of overstretch in terms of attrition, um you know, partnerships are made up of people and sometimes other other priorities get in the way and it wouldn't have been wise for us to kind of, to, you know, to just aim for a low number and hope that they would all work. In, in A lot of the success has been personal relationships, luck, things like that. Um, but I think the wise thing to do is just not overly investing in a small number um, and just kind of knowing when to move forward and when not to. A huge learning for us and maybe if I have to say the most important one it's just that research is important and it takes time in the beginning and in our project proposal we really I think underestimated the amount of research needed to make the right impression on a prospective partner like it's like a sales pitch essentially to kind of borrow a term from the private sector that level of going into your first meeting and not and having a bit of an idea about how you would want to work with this person um, investment in who they are and how to approach them um, is just really significant. Like we've we've seen the difference in when we've actually done the research and investment and we've taken our time and not just jumped into a meeting um, versus where we haven't. And it's 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 especially with maybe the stickier, more difficult partners, it, it has made all of the difference. Um, and when you know them really well and and you know they're impressed and they're far more receptive if you have direct ideas about what their challenges might be and how you can help them and I just think for those of you embarking on this work um, accommodating staff time in this because our staff really did need you know those few days of desk time and thorough thinking and um, rather than just kind of jumping someone at a conference um, um, like for example one conversation which is still early for us is um, a conversation with the police education in Denmark um, and you know us having to research an area like police education which is one that we really don't know very much about but having to look at the issues for example the low investment in police training and how that how they can meet their SDG targets for example has made um those conversations far more productive and effective um and, and you know potentially will lead to something really exciting for our, our Danish partner I'm going through these quite quickly but I will definitely be able to recap if if anything is unclear um, and just the obvious there's no one size fits all approach for partnerships in the early stages of the part of the project we had long conversations about for example should every partnership need an MOU um, and we found that actually it would be really inhibiting for, for every single partnership to need like a partnership framework or an MOU in some cases you just want to set a shared goal and work towards it together and getting contractual or legal or whatever might actually hamper it but in other cases like let's say our governmental or ministerial partners you know having an MOU of course makes things far easier and far more embedded in the real work and it guarantees that actually the work will get done um, as well as that, I, I alluded to this earlier but just the example of the coalition in Estonia um, which brings together NGOs, private sector, academia and state institutions. So the coalition format is designed to get each of these actors committed in spite of areas of different interests um, and that really works really well in that context even though in other contexts we do have a lot of one-on-one -on -one organization versus organization partnerships um, but just having the flexibility to maybe create coalitions or networks um, rather than one-on-one -on -one partnerships has been something that's been quite important for us when you're thinking about the overall goals which is that partnerships are, you know are a tool it doesn't need to be sort of um it, the, the nature of the relationship needs to be designed in accordance with the needs and the goals um we've also had to learn flexibility in terms of 
how how partnerships are formed um like starting with for example trainings and then engaging um a particular partner over time rather than sort of like emailing out front and being like can we start a partnership um so there's definitely just some some flexibility and some real strategy needed there um the the final point i'll make and i mean again i know this 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 does sound obvious but I, to a certain degree, I, this would have been really helpful for us to know in the beginning, but just real courage is needed to initiate partnerships with those who may not have heard of GCE or the SDGs and may work with an, you know, an entirely different arena. It hasn't always been comfortable. Um, and I think as a team, most of whom are, we're not necessarily partnership professionals or experts, we probably have different areas of, of expertise, but the perseverance to approach and chase up someone who you're worried might not be interested in talking to you um, you know all of that does take sort of team capacity and team development and I think if we weren't part of a consortium supporting each other that would be a lot more difficult but we do try and do things like we've practiced our pitching towards each other and role playing and and we've tried to consult those who are, you know, we've consulted those who are in the sector who might be friendly voices, like people who are known to us personally and so forth. But that investment in in kind of becoming like, I mean, it sounds cynical, but a salesperson, um, it, it has really been worth it for us in many cases. Um, so, our, our, you know, our learning continues as Bridge 47 um, continues and we're, continue, we're just trying to share um, on what might be relevant and um, I'm really keen to actually hear from everybody else and it sounded like from the word cloud that some of you have had similar experiences but um, I'd love to hear the details. So at this point it would be great um, to, to open it up and um, to see if we can gather any kind of examples from those of you that are on the call and um, I hope you like my, my graphic about uncomfortable partnerships. Um, so I think I'll, I'll hand over to Ricardo to manage this next steps. Um, thanks everyone. Thank you so much Maeve, thank you so much Gabriel. Uh, it's so interesting to hear from all your, uh, from your experiences. Um, before we are, well maybe we are starting with the examples from you um, as Maeve suggested, because um, Amit uh, mentioned already the Angel Network, um, as well as the GENE, the Global Education Network Europe, and um, the Angel Network, which is the academic network on global education and learning. And maybe I'm uh, handing over, first of all, to Gabriel. Um, are you aware of these uh, two networks Amit uh, is asking? Uh, wait a second. So, together and also the gene if we'll also, start again we, we couldn't leave. Uh, sorry so this year i attended angel conference it was uh, based on an invitation of uh, bridge 47 so i met some people there may was there too and also gene because one of the speakers i'm gonna have tomorrow uh, on the conference is from gene so both yeah okay yes yes thank you so much for this example um amit um these are uh, networks and um, yeah, networks we are very well aware of. Um, and before we are continuing with your uh, um, examples, I would like to uh, come back to some of the questions you have asked and um, several of them might have been um, answered already during the inputs by Maeve, but Maeve, maybe you would like to repeat a few, like the very questions like um, are there um, partnerships outside of Europe as well and um, do your partnerships support private sector or only civil society organizations so that we are sure that um, the message came across. Sure um, so outside of Europe has been a challenge for us because of course we're a consortium um, mostly made up of European national organizations so our desire was certainly to have global partnerships and we have um, we have one um but it was really challenging in terms of um like you know my organization is is a is a national body in ireland and partnering with sort of a global entity on the other end like a big corporation or something it, it was quite tricky 
um, we weren't able to, so we have one, but we weren't able to successfully do many, many work, many because just of the nature of what our organizations know and what they can offer. Having said that, we do have um, within our partnerships, several organizations that are, that we do believe have multiplier effect in the sense that um, we, one of our partners in Estonia is um, Telia, um, the corporation Telia. Um, and be, you know, and they're they're based, and DHL is another, and these are obviously you know based in several countries, and the aspiration has been, you know, to actually to kind of to bring those partnerships to other countries, um, but yeah, it's been difficult to to kind of match our organizational expertise and our global ambition, and it's something that I think is you know part of part of the legacy of Bridge Forty Seven or whatever comes next, and what others do, I think, you know, it, it, it needs to be addressed. Um, so that's the question about, about global partnerships. Um, and the other question, um, Ricardo, can you remind me what the other question is? I'm just scrolling through the chat box, but yes, I know you're, you're um, going in maybe, order. Maybe, yeah, maybe we uh, go in order. Francesco asked, um, so do your partnerships support private sector only civil society organizations and do your partnerships support impact investing or investor matching or grant making for global citizenship education startups so just on the first one about private sector or only cso's um because the the objective is typically to um bring gce um to other places um we usually have a cso component who the cso's are part of the partnerships or one half of the partnerships and because we are made up of cso's typically um, our partnerships are made up of one or more of our consortium partners um, and then externals, including private sector, of which we have many. But we also encourage many of the Bridge 47 mem um, consortium partners are membership based platforms. Um, so, for example, my organization in Ireland has 70 CSO members and our partnership activities are all around um, having those CSOs partner primarily with private sector and that's the design of the work that the partnerships work that we do in Ireland um, so so I hope that, uh, that that answers your question but that's typically how we work in terms of the organizations um, who we support in terms of partnerships and um, you know tell me in the chat box if that's not unclear and then your, your question about impact investing or investor matching or grant making, and this is exactly the direction we should be going. Um, it wasn't part of the initial design of Bridge 47. Um, and, you know, connected to funding, what we've had in Bridge 47 is that typically, unusually, um, for example, when we approach private sector, we do have the funding to support our activities. So when we're approaching them, we're sort of saying, we want to work together. We want to find ways of um, having you participate in GCE and we have the funds to, to, to support those activities. Um, and we've been doing that for other CSOs who are not Bridge 47 specific as well, um, which of course is connected to the lifespan of the project. Um, in terms of actual grant support, we do in the project have um, a subgranting mechanism for small grants for global citizenship education, and then part of that is is um, encouraging global citizenship education practitioners to participate in partnerships, and there are grants for partnerships included in that. We just did a call for proposals on that um, in the past few months, um, and we're likely to do another one in the new year as well. Um, so that's kind of where where our bandwidth has been in, in, in that area. But um, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's you know, uh, investor matching and impact investing is absolutely where I hope, I hope to see more of those conversations in the future. Um, because, you know, that's, that's really what's going to make um, these partnerships grow fruit. Is, okay, so I, I think that covers those two. Yeah. Um, do you want me to to go through more or do you want well, to take like to, yeah uh, maybe also um gabriel wants to come in on the on the next one um from yes. cecilia about um yeah her question is mainstreaming uh, gce in formal education system or only in non-formal education uh, systems uh, or both maybe gabriel or you would like okay. to respond to cecilia's question so I can combine it with the answer to the last question as well, because that was one of the reasons uh, uh, for the 
for our partnership is to bring more international global perspective from uh, from uh, Asia Pacific and in Asia as well. So it comes together with our initiative to open up uh, communities university uh, to other countries in Asia Pacific. So we have an MOU uh, with uh, New Zealand, Taiwan is an opening in Thailand as well. But um, it's been difficult in terms of the funding. So we'll try to go now digital. So that's one of the things. And the idea is to get the partnership before somebody can travel or, or make it more, I don't know, in, in terms of uh, really uh, exchange in person is to uh, have maybe courses which are extracurricular and also within courses uh, which we teach and have uh, teaching which can be combined or have some at least uh, topics which we can discuss with students uh, from abroad and from Asia and Pacific. So okay. And, um, and just to add, um, yeah, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, from the Bridge 47 perspective, we, tr we try to cover formal and non-formal. Um, in some of our geographies, like for example in Finland they they are you know, for their national work they're really trying to focus more on non-formal because you know formal they feel is largely in a good place and and there's a lot of focus on formal and they want to they want to give bandwidth um to non-formal um but in many of our geographies we absolutely have to focus on both and I think there's there's a healthy mix across both in terms of our, our direct partnerships thanks for that question it's a good one and one I should have clarified Thank you, Maeve. And maybe you would like to continue already with the next one. Um, um, Chiara is asking uh, what national governments are thinking about the project. So what is the perspective of national government uh, towards the project? She was referring mainly to partner countries. Sure. I think, um, I think we've gotten a lot of support from national governments. Most of um, our consortium partners are, of course, funded by their national governments or working with their national governments. Um, and this is kind of an additional um, piece of work. And I think in many of our countries, you know, they, they they're, they're, you know, they're glad to have us part of part of EU work and they're glad to see their national work elevated um, onto kind of the European stage, especially you'll have seen from our list of countries that most that we mostly have quite small European countries in, in this project. Um, and I think um, the focus and um, the advocacy work that we're doing as well, um, which is in another area of the, of the project, not necessarily partnerships, although we do have some advocacy partnerships. Um, you know, I think that adds great weight um, to sort of, in, in many cases, to like to what national governments are, 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 are trying to achieve. We had an event in Helsinki very much focused on advocacy not too long ago called Envision 4.7. Maybe some of you have heard of it or, or were in attendance. Um, and we had great representation from different departments and governments. Um, I think as well, it really depends on the, the ministry and, and we have different relationships with different ministries in different national contexts. Um, so what many of our consortium partners have done is they've sort of used the partnership space and the investment in partnerships to perhaps develop a stronger or even a new relationship with the governmental minister ministry that they maybe are less um, have less history with. So that that can differ from country to country. So, so you're not seeing. So where we have a, a partner who works really well with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, they're not using that as a partnership, but they're using, they're they're thinking, oh, maybe we need a better relationship with the Ministry for Education. So we'll use the Bridge Forty Seven time and resources, um, towards investing in that. Um, so that's a big part of our goal. That that in many respects, our our national consortium partners will will have stronger governmental links and sort of stronger weight in terms of advocacy um, as a byproduct of the project. I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you so much, Maeve. Um, yeah, I hope um, this answers your question, Chiara. Um, and um, in, we, we, we have another nine minutes. So um, I'm looking a little bit uh, uh, on my watch. So before we continuing with your question, please uh, continue typing in them into the chat box. I would like to ask Francesco to come in verbally very, very briefly, um, maybe in uh, a minute or two, uh, to explain us and tell us more about your uh, your startup. So I'm going to switch on your microphone. I hope that's okay, Francesco. 
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, this time with me. I just introduced myself very quickly. I own a, a, a training organization in the UK. It has been running for 10 years, organizing mobility for students and students in Erasmus Plus. I'm now trying to set up uh, uh, here in Italy, where I am now, uh, a center for global citizenship education, organizing mobility for students and teachers. Uh, under Erasmus Plus uh, uh, for uh, the uh, European education system. So it will organize uh, experiential learning and uh, teacher development courses for teachers from, from all Europe. So I am now in the process of collecting uh, uh, the initial funding, which is uh, uh, needed to develop the activities for the startup phase. So I am interested to learn more about whether Bridge 47 is doing uh, or is planning to do anything in the field of uh, developing an ecosystem for not only civil society organizations, but also for those private partners who are supporting the education systems in the field of global citizenship education. Thank you so much, Francesco. And um, before I ask Maeve to respond, maybe um, Maeve, you could um, combine your response to Francesco with um, Amit's a question on the best ways to engage with Bridge 47 with idea solution and potential uh, for partnership. Sure. Yeah, I mean, oh, I mean, I think, um, I mean, everything you're saying would be amazing for um, to, to, to be able to achieve. Um, it, in terms of the current design of Bridge 47, I think because, as you know, we're funded um, by the EU and I think that we responded, when we responded, one of the restrictions in the DEER call, which is the Development Education Awareness Raising call, was um, that any funding supports had to be given to nonprofits or civil society. So direct kind of support to private sector or kind of that ecosystem, which as you correctly identify is very much needed. Um, that wasn't part of our design, but then I know the next year call that came out after us did actually include direct support to private sector or private sector and more encouragement of private sector partners. Um, we don't know. Um, and there's, apparently a new deer call in 2021 and um, so it's not part of our project design and we probably don't really have the bandwidth to cover it but you are seeing the move in the direction of kind of encouraging partnerships and encouraging ecosystem support um, for, for non-CSO partners um, coming from the EU and um, so I'd encourage you to keep an, an eye on that um, and then I would encourage you also to keep an eye on um, our subgranting mechanism, which I think will be out in the new year, and if that's of interest to you or the people you work with, as well. But of course, it does it encourages CSO, CSO private sector, CSO media, CSO other other types of partnerships. So there are partnerships that do involve a CSO, um, as we need to have the CSO as the lead um, recipient of any grants. Um, but it, but it, of course you know it encourages those working relationships and ideally it's it, it's 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 pushing the support and expanding the support um so that's kind of where we are in terms of um that but but i agree with you that it would be it would be really innovative and excited to see it to see more of it in the future and you're you are seeing the green shoots of this um with the the changing focus in the past year in the most recent deer call and I hope that answers again. I'm say, I keep saying I hope that answers your question. <laughs> These are good questions, though. Um, Ricardo, would you like me to move forward to um, the next one? And actually, I think it's a good question for you, Ricardo, in terms of keeping in touch with Bridge Forty Seven. Do you want to? Do you want to? You were, I think you were going to talk about that anyway. Um, so, do you want to kind of respond to that one? Um, wait a second. Um, so before, just like keeping um, in touch with yes. our network. Yes, yes, yes. But because um, I'm going to be saying this at the very end anyway, and we have only four more minutes left. Um, and we have a very, very spe specific question for you, Maeve, um, which I want to um, uh, forward to you now. It's about uh, the UK leaving the EU, um, how this is um, going to be affect any partnerships with Bridge for the Seven and where does the UK stand in terms of GCE when they finally leave the EU? Yeah, and this is a good question, and and you know, our, I mean, our, our our Scottish colleague Eleanor is in, is is on the line, and she's dealing with the front lines of this. Um, and of course, I think 
all EU projects um, that had um, a UK partner involved I had to grapple with this. Um, our, our project ends in September 2020. Um, so by the way, you know, obviously we're keeping a close eye on things and it's been the process, it's been, there's been lengthy conversations in terms of our work. And, but we are effectively covered in terms of our support and everything else until, um, until September 2020. Um, so obviously, it, it's it's as clear as mud as it is on a, on a variety of other things. Um, but we push forward. We're working effectively with the NHS and some others. And um, unless you know something dramatic happens in terms of like all EU projects are closed in, in our case we're sort of feeling like we can get as much as we can done between now and the, and the project closure but beyond that period of time um yeah it remains up in the air and um i'd like to have better answers for you <laughs> as you can imagine um but that's that's where we are we have to just keep a close eye on it and you know do the good work that we're, that we're trying to do and hopefully um by working with like and, and and you know by by actually doing as much as we can in this uncertain time, um, there's less of a, a thud, um, should should things go awry, um, and the final there was another question about local government. Do you want me to take that as well, Ricardo? Yeah. I know you're pressing for time, <laughs> um, local government. And thank you for asking this because this has been kind of a bugbear for us, um, we and there are there there are other EU projects that are very much really directly targeted towards local government, um, on GCE. Um, we we tried in a couple of different geographies unsuccessfully um, to forge good partnerships with local government and we didn't manage to get there and of course different contexts um, I, I, I think that they're a really interesting area and I'd love to see them, them, them tackled more but having said that our Irish partnership and one of the, the learnings from our Irish partnership with a lobby group who pushed for um, greater female political representation, we've ended up focusing on newly elected councillors at local level in that partnership. And the interest levels have been really high and the engagement with the SDGs and the kind of um, the dialogues that we're, being, we're able to have is, have been really good. Like for example, um, you know, when you're, when you're sort of, we, we have this training which um, asks them to use the SDGs at local level. And I think we can, we're in the, we can probably share those resources very soon. It was something that we developed for the project, but we we found really great responsiveness from it so far. We've only had two trainings. We're about to have another one in January. It shows real promise um, and it does just show when, I think if we directly contracted local government, may, which we did in other countries, maybe we wouldn't have had the same gains, but because we kind of went through this group, this lobby group who, um, who are doing trainings for local councillors anyway. It was almost an example of the mechanism um, got us into an interesting stakeholder group. Um, so I don't know whether that experience is, is similar to yours, but um, I would, yeah, I, I, I would love to see more in that space as it seems to be really fertile. Okay, I'm talking too much. Is, is there anything else you'd like me to cover, Ricarda, or anyone else on the line? Well, thank you so much. And um, I, I know I'm always the, the, I'm the timekeeper and always conscious of time, but um, I am um, trying to finish everything um, in approximately an hour. So um, please, if you have any burning questions, type them in now. Um, um, I would like to give the word again to Gabriel. Um, um, if you have um, any final remarks or anything you feel like um, should be added. Um, for example, because what Francesco was do, uh, saying, and also there were some questions, and May mentioned the sub sub scheme. So we answered one sub scheme, <coughs> which was a funding uh, in terms of uh, IT technology, and it was it, it kind of combined uh, in a way what we were trying to do. That it doesn't need to be a CEO, uh, I mean, or NGO. It was a within our department, uh, we have a unit which is more uh, IT focused. So they worked as a, as a private company almost and hopefully we will develop an app which helps uh, debating and persuasive communication in terms of uh, a tool which we can use uh, with students in uh, political communication. So that would be an example. And if, if, if there wasn't that fund from Bridge, we wouldn't be able to do it. But also the idea came from, uh, from what we're doing within the Bridge in terms of having the uh, citizenship element in its citizenship education. 
Thank you so much, Gabriel. And the final uh, topic we are tackling is uh, maybe if you, if you, as you have seen, there are some questions on the tone of voice language. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, so um, we did develop a resource which talks a little bit about our tone of voice journey um, and the experience we had. And it does also show kind of before and after in terms of our language. As I said, it's an ongoing process and it's not, you know, it was really useful for us to build our confidence and to kind of, kind of get us out of some of our bad habits as a team. Um, and I'd encourage organizations um, to follow a similar process. I think we all need to be working on tone of voice. Um, so, so let me share that resource and I'm happy to share the name of the consultant as well we worked with in case other organizations are, are keen. Um, he was very specifically, he has a, he, he's um, got a background working for private sector. So we kind of had private sector in mind as an audience. So just being mindful of, of that as well when I do send around the resource. Um, but yeah, I think it was a really good kind of confidence building exercise for us in terms of getting our partnerships off the ground and just a good practice more broadly for any organization that wants to communicate what they do effectively. Um, so let me send that to Ricardo who can share it with those of you who are on the call. Exactly. Thank you so much. Yes, I will be um, sharing these resources as well as uh, the names. Um, you will be receiving also the PowerPoint uh, you have been seeing today as well as uh, the recording. So you can watch this exciting webinar over and over again. Um, so um, I hope you don't mind. Um, I know that discussion is very, very um, interesting, but I think we're going to be wrapping up here. Um, so um, we would like to invite you to our next webinar. <laughs> um, and we hope uh, for um, as high of, uh, of a turn up like today, our next webinar will be also looking at knowledge creation um, and um, collaborations. It will be organized together with EADI and MAVE has been mentioning the European Association of Development Research and Training uh, today already. It's um, about the Synergias Network. It's a network between civil society organizations and higher education institutions and uh, La Saleta Coelho from the University of, Por of Porto will join us. Uh, oh yeah, um, Dalilia, um, um, hello, she's uh, saying hello from Portugal right now. Um, and so you can sign up to this webinar. Um, I will be sending out the link um, as soon as possible to sign up for this one as well. And keep an eye on our website for further events like this and our social media and sub uh, subscribe to our newsletter. Or you can send me uh, directly an email as well. And we are very curious to hear what you um, think of today's uh, webinar. So please, um, Send us um, your feedback. Let us know uh, how we can improve, um, what we can do better, or if you just like it. Um, so um, I copied the link to the feedback form into the chat box. And um, yes, um, how you can keep in touch uh, with us and the Bridge 47 Network. So you can come, you can become a member. Um, I've included um, the link into the PowerPoint presentation to join the Bridge 47 Network. And as mentioned already, uh, sign up for um, uh, our newsletter, follow us on social media. We have a Facebook group where we are um, sharing our experiences, resources regularly, and yeah, follow us on Twitter. So I think, um, yeah, that's from me. Um, apart from saying thank you, thank you, Maeve, thank you, Gabriel, for this very interesting discussion. I know we could have continued even longer. Um, and there were so many interesting questions from you participants as well. So thank you so much. Um, thanks to all of you. And yeah, see you at the next webinar. Join us again. Thank you. Have a good thanks day. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.